Kerry Katona. Hi, you love it. You're on my to the show. <laughs> How long you got? <laughs> <laughs> I used to go on the rob with me mum. My mum gave me my first drug when I was 14. Oh, yeah, you're all right. You went, hiya, Kerry. Fucking hell, he knows my name. I became a millionaire overnight. And then when I finally got the fame, I hated it, Matt. The way I was treated by ITV, there was no aftercare, no nothing. They just wanted the headlines. I had nowhere to turn and it, I was suicidal. Hang on a minute, you're fucking a teenage boy behind your wife's back. You've mentioned a few times through this conversation, only fans. Yeah. So let's plug dig, it, plug it, plug it, plug it. No, I'm that. not giving you mates right, Matt. <laughs> so I married my mum's drug dealer. You gotta laugh, Matt, you gotta <laughs> laugh. It was Prince William, Prince Harry, Kerry Katona. Well, I'll follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> but what a story to tell, eh, Matt? It's been a colourful life. I'll have rewind yeah. to, uh, you know, to, to where it all began. All right, well, let's see if you can try keep up. Guys, Matt Haycox, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycox Show, where I've got a guest today who I know is going to provide us loads of banter, <laughs> loads of fun, and hopefully uh, some, some great stories. She'll be here any minute. <laughs> <laughs> and some great advice too. Kerry Katona. Hi, well, you love it. You're right, my darling. Welcome to the show. Thank you good, for having me. Thank you for coming. It's very nice to be here. I was going to say we've. I mean, we've been talking ten or fifteen minutes before before we started, and yeah. there's. Uh, I know there's going to be so much. Uh... Yeah, my foster mum said that I can talk a glass eye to sleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, there's no fear of me being asleep just yet. But <laughs> listen, you. I mean, you mentioned your foster mum. I guess yeah. that take that takes us right right back to the beginning of life yeah. in a way. I mean, um, I mean, my audience is. I mean, I've I've known known of you for twenty plus you know twenty plus years. I mean, we're a similar age, but I guess for a lot of my audience who, who are younger, who may know who you are today but don't mm -hmm. know the backstory. Let's let's rewind yeah. to uh, you know to, to where it all began you had a, a, a kind of a troubled childhood to a degree so yeah. uh, all right well let's see if you can try to keep up so i'm a product of an affair so when i was born the guy who i called dad for two years his dad i called granddad right but my mum left the guy who i called dad for my granddad and married him so my dad became my brother and my granddad became my dad we're gonna have to put some infographics on this podcast yes, so we can follow absolutely. Us. <laughs> i'm already confused and then when i was seven my mum left him for a woman and then I found out that this other guy called Ronnie Armstrong was my dad. My first memory is watching my mum slit wrist at the age of three. So my mum had a lot of mental health issues. Um, and she slit wrist up until I was like 17. She was always an OD and trying to kill herself. And that's why I've got Molly and Lily on my wrist. And sorry to interrupt, when you say that, you, that's your first memory, as in you, you, even now yeah. you can, you can gen that, genuinely remember that. That's my first memory, that, yeah. yeah. These memories before that, but I will never die of bulging. So it's something I've not dealt with myself. So that's why I've got um, Molly and Lily on my wrist. I have four sets lost parents three refuges, eight different schools. My mum's fellow was a guy called Dave Wheat. He was inside with the craze. We actually got a Christmas card off the craze. And the reason I got put in foster home was because my mum's fella told us he was Freddy Krueger. He stabbed her. I pulled the knife out of her leg. He wanted to cut our tits and finally off and chop us up in the fridge. And we was in refuges and foster homes and all kinds of things. Yeah, it was, um, I used to go on the rob with me mum. I used to, my mum gave me my first drug when I was 14. She told me it was sherbet and it was speed. So I didn't know any different. Oh, she, she didn't give you it because you wanted it? No, 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 no. So I was only allowed to have supervised visits with my mum. But obviously I, I'm an only child from my mum. And my mum begged me never to go find my real dad. So I wouldn't do that because he was a married man. And I was in foster home at the time. And my mum had moved back up from London back up north and obviously your mum's the centre of the universe I mean, mum was a lesbian at the time and she went in the toilets and she was in there for ages like what's she doing so I followed her in I'll never forget what I had I had a pair of jeans on I was only 14 I was very very well developed these are mine by the way and I had a little top on that said handle with care and I went in the toilet and she had this bag of white powder I said what are you doing she went here she went like that and rubbed it on my gums and it was it was speed. So that was something I end up doing with my mum every weekend and save me pocket money up off my foster but, parents. But just going back to that first time yeah. you had it, I mean what what was it like what was it Foster's like? It was you? great, it didn't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but let's be honest, I've got ADHD anyway, I'm like fucking Tigger on speed as it is. But I didn't know any difference. It, it was you know, I've done all the drugs you can possibly think of and I've had many a great time on drugs but it, it almost killed me but at that moment in time I thought oh this is great because well, I was brought up in like really rough pubs I mean like I was 
like where I'm from was really, when I say really rough, like my mum wouldn't think twice about bottling you and stabbing you. That's the kind of woman my mum was. Is she still alive today, your mum? Yeah, yeah, my mum's still alive. She's still alive and kicking, still drinking every day, but she's still my mother. Don't see as much of her as what I used to, I guess. Things just change over the years. And I'll always love my mum. She's the only mum I've got. She's the only person. There's only her, Dawn and Leslie in my life who knew me before I was famous. And I had a, a very volatile relationship with my mum. I was trying to buy her love and, you know, she she'd sit there and she'd go, you know, I don't want to be here anymore because then Dave died. And so in the end, I went, right, here. I went in a, the sh in a bathroom. I took all the tablets. I go on, go on, do it. Kill yourself. Take them all. Take them all. And I made it take all the tablets. I went, right, I'll ring you an ambulance. I'm going back to my foster parents. I've got an exam in the morning. How old were you? 15, that was. I think it was, well, what was that when Dave died? 15, I think I was, when Dave passed away. And that that's where a lot of my troubles stem from. I always never felt good enough. Like, why does my mum not want to be around for me? And, and, and it's like, we're all victims of victims. So I'm not going to go, oh, poor me, which I did for a long time, Matt. I lived in a pity party. Everyone owed me. It was Brian's fault for leaving me. It was my accountants for robbing me. It was my mum for me childhood that's gonna get me nowhere but i can't blame my mum for my childhood because it's made me who i am today and i wouldn't change any of it so we are all victims of victims my mum had a shitty shit 10 times worse than me you know my kids are victims of me you know even though their childhood was nothing like mine but just by me being their mum, they get so much shit. So we are all victims of victims, and it's just how we deal with that that makes us who we are. And when you say or you used to blame everybody else for mm. everything, how how do you look at it now? Like, do you do you blame yourself? No, don't blame anybody. It's nobody's fault. You, you, it's you, just things you're that put on a to path. You. Yeah, I mean, sitting there, you know, blaming everybody for how you how you turned out is the most self centered thing you, I think anyone could possibly do. I was I was in a self pity party. You know, everyone. It's like nobody owe me anything no they, there's nothing I can do about my past there's nothing I can do about it and I've not made mistakes they've all been lessons Matt I've got no regrets with the drugs the drink the bankruptcy the divorces because it's made me who I am today and I feel amazing for who I am and I'm able to tell my story and help others I've been completely and utterly misjudged by the press and I have we all make mistakes but like back in the day especially the first the first divorce with me and Brian that was just horrendous that was a massive trigger for me that was rejection all over again because Brian didn't love me he loved somebody else and that for me was like taking me back to my childhood and then thinking oh my god my kids are from a broken home what am I going to do I need to fix it so I married my mum's drug dealer well, I thought I was going to get it for free but I didn't <laughs> 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 you gotta laugh, Mike. You gotta <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Let me just rewind a bit to try and try and keep, keep a bit okay. cr bit of chronology here. And just just to uh, last question on your on your childhood. Yeah. I mean, you went to obviously lots eight schools. I think you said yeah. and uh, multiple fo uh, foster parents. And my parents. kids have been to a lot of schools as well because I've moved around quite a bit. But, but for when you were going to, to the multiple schools, is that because you were getting kicked out? What? Why, no, just because different... we was always moving around. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have a very. My, so I had seven different junior schools and one high school. I'm dyslexic. I remember going back to one school for a day and I couldn't spell the word orange I probably still can't <laughs> and the kids took the piss out of me because when I'm angry I put the mic on and I'm like wanker <laughs> but when I met Brian my first husband and I was pregnant with Molly he was away on tour so I taught myself how to read and write but what you, you couldn't read and write until no, you were what, 20 no not very well as, no so when I got an atomic kitten to bear in mind that so I got put into so when I was in foster home I had awesome tits and I really, really did. I was no a size, so, you know, I was this little waist, 36 double D chest. And I thought, well, this is my get out. So I wanted to be a page three model because that, that was all the rage back then. I wanted to be like Samantha Fox. But because I had a court order on me, this sum wouldn't print it. So I got the court order lifted. And then when I was 16, I got put into a semi-independence home. And then I got my first flat when I was 17. Then I was in a nightclub, Mr. Smith's underage. And then I got spotted. And then I went and met a guy called Andy McCluskey from Orcastle Moves in the Dark. And next thing you know, I'm in a girl band. And two years later, I've got this massive fairy tale wedding to another boy band member. Life changed overnight like that. And when I never went looking for it. It found me. So, well, you've kind of answered answered the question I never got to ask, which was how how did the Atomic Kitten thing come about? I mean, you mentioned you were you were spotted, mm. spotted to be in a band. Yeah, it's just I had big tits and blonde hair. Okay, but they, <laughs> Let's be honest. But they, they didn't know you could sing. You hadn't yeah, been doing I've any singing. Yeah, I've always sang. I've always did karaoke. I was, I always knew I was going to be famous. And like, as I'm in my 40s now, and I look back and I've had to dissect my life, I think 
I thought the fame, I just wanted to be so desperately loved. That's all I ever wanted. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to make my mum happy. I wanted to make it. I thought, if I get this record deal, everything will change. So when I met Andy McCluskey, I took out my pay three photograph. I've never been for an audition in my life. Sat down, told a few dirty jokes and sang songs. And I have got a good voice. And uh, they based the band around me. And I was a founder member for two months. And I named us Atomic Kitten. We held auditions. And I picked Liz McLaren and Heidi Range, who... Then yep. went on in the Sugar Babes. Heidi and Liz didn't get on. One of them slapped one, or, or some, well, someone slapped somebody. I don't, can't remember who it was. Bear in mind, I was the eldest. I was 17 when I joined the band. I had my 18th birthday with them. But because I had no adults around me, my mum was always pissed up and or in the pub or whatever. So I, I was so grown up by myself anyway. And then we got Natasha. And I hated it. I didn't, don't like the word hate. Didn't like Natasha at all. And they went, give it two weeks. And then I fell madly in love with Tash. And four weeks later, we got a record deal. So how long was the band together before you actually released an out, released a song that people we, would know who you were? You know what it was? This is back in the day when bands and pop stars were proper pop stars and you had to really graft yeah. and do all the shitty nightclubs and have the bottles throughout your head and do all like the school gigs. And like we really, really grafted. And I enjoyed that bit i enjoyed the climb and then when i finally got the fame i hated it matt i despised it especially out the three of us because i was a blonde one the gobby one with the big tits like we do a photo shoot with the sun in leather cat suits very famous picture of us in these cat suits and i think we was up at four o'clock in the morning to go to do disney channel and the paper was out and me and carl our tour manager went i'll go get the paper girls and me and carl went in i picked it up i went oh for fuck's sake he went, it's just you, in it? I went, yeah, I'm not getting in the car. And then, like, we do SMTV and CG UK and we do Chums and Conor McAnally, the producer, loved me and he always wanted to pick me to do it. I was like, I don't want it, you girls do it. And then I remember the first night I went out... Oh, was we... that causing big friction with it? Yeah, I think so. And then, obviously, I started dating Brian. So then it was all about me and Brian. So I understand that and I get that. And then when I fell pregnant with Molly, I just... I just I just wanted to be a mummy. That's all I've ever wanted to be is being mum. That's what I was born to be a mum. And I'm still learning today. You know, just because I've got five kids, you know, I'm I'm, I'm still learning how to be a mum. When you say all you wanted to be was a mum, since you were a kid. I didn't want to be rich and famous. I wanted to be a mum and have a husband and the From kids like 14, come. 15, That's 16. all I ever wanted. Since as young as I can remember. But I always knew I was going to be famous. But was, and did you want to be a mum because you knew, I guess, how, how, badly you'd been treated as a kid that you wanted I to I think what it was my dream was to have a family unit because I never had that and it also took me a long time as well with the children regards to me keep getting married that it took me to the age of 36 to realize that I was more than enough for my children and I know my kids have got daddy issues I, I get that 100% because I've got daddy issues I, I've eventually got to meet my half sisters and brothers when I was 28 because of the news that world found him knocked on the door and said we're gonna run a story that your husband's cheated and he's got a dark called kerry and it's kerry katona and she said we buried him six months ago how cruel is that they didn't need to know that anyway they help they welcome me with open arms and i love them to bits and they're, they're my everything but my dream was to be a mum and have a husband and have the kids and obviously brian was my knight in shining armor he took me from living with my mum to living in all these pubs and doing drugs and all that kind of shit to moving to ireland and i I just wanted to be a stay-at-home mum and I gave, as soon as I found out I was pregnant I was like I'm done I just want to go and Brian typical Irish Catholic man wife at home raise the kids and I was quite happy with that then I got bored <laughs> So, so let's let's just backtrack probably a few months or a year or so at that point. So, how did you come to leave the band? And also, you left just before the kind of the real level of success. Yeah. So, it? Hole Again was my number one. It was my vocals. So I but left. You never got to perform it. Yeah, well, yeah, was, yeah, oh, so, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So you. It was so your I was vocals. doing all the promotion for Hole Again. Oh, when were... I left. Okay. I I started bleeding. I was spotting, and the doctor said, "Look, you need to rest because." I was pregnant. You didn't know you were pregnant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I knew okay. I was pregnant. But so I'm, I'm continuing working. And then when I started spotting and, and bleeding, I got rushed to hospital and Brian was like, look, just leave. So I was actually going to take over Kat Dealey's place on SMTV. But then Connor was like, look, it's not going to look good, a teenager being pregnant. Well, I was 20, you know, to one of their famous boy band members. So I, I just, I just, I didn't enjoy the fame. It was always about me and Brian. That wasn't fair on the girls. It kind of forgot about the music. And we were just about to get drunk. And we begged him to, can we just release Hole again? And it was originally spoken all the way through. It was originally me, but then All Saints had never, ever 
Yeah. So we had to change it. So um, yeah, and it, we we did so much promotion. I I said I, this will be my last song. I'm gonna leave. I'm pregnant. I want to be a mum. And um, yeah, and I, I just left. And there was there was no regrets when you when you did leave. You, you, you weren't. You know there was that. Fuck's sake! <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. <laughs> one more but, song. <laughs> but no, but for me, I got I got my biggest number one, and that was my Molly. I had my baby, and that's all I ever wanted. I wanted a husband and 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 kids, and that has always been my dream. And I became a millionaire overnight. You know, I remember me and Brian when we went to buy our first house. Like, oh my god, it's got a dishwasher. <laughs> Oh my god, I can't believe it. I thought I was ever rich. I what, was, but <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the money like for you in Atomic Kissing? Because I mean you it wasn't uh, it wasn't that great. I remember I had I think I had thirty seven thousand pounds and I bought me on my house with it before I moved to Ireland. Because as as uh, you, you the get public, pe- pe- it's we, yeah, not we, all, like we that, always yeah. hear that you know these these big no, you know, boy you get, bands. You get a bands. wage. You get a wage. It's the sponsorships that where you get your money. And if you write the songs, that's where you get your money. I can't write for shit. I just stood there looking pretty, to be honest. But you get your PDs, your PD, you know, you you get like pocket money, like five hundred pound a week, and it's hard work. It's I mean, I remember we did a Southeast Asia tour, and all three of us end up in hospital on a drip. Really? I mean, I mean, really you probably don't work. get t- t- chance to spend any money anyway, do you? Well, the, you, you get everything for free. It's so funny because money goes to money. So the, like, when Brian wanted me to move to Ireland, I bought me my house, kept it in my name, but because obviously well, back in England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I just packed and I, I moved. To, I moved to Dublin, which I still class as my second home, and I lo- I love Ireland so much. And I'm, every time I go over there, the Irish adore me, and I love them. And yeah, it, it's really crazy because Molly and Lily have no record. Reco- like you've got more memories of me and Brian being together than my own kids. The first time Molly and Lily had us both in the same room was Molly's twenty first. Really? That's quite sad. That's really sad. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I didn't get maintenance money or anything like that. I just took the girls. I did it all by myself. Let me make that really clear. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, she's getting... No, 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 no. I signed a piece of paper. I got my kids. He went to Australia. And that's all I wanted. I got half the money off the house and that was it. And so prior to that, so when when you've you've left the band, you're with Brian, you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. What, I mean, what, what were you doing for work or money at that Nothing. point? Nothing. No, no, I just stayed at home. I, was, I just became a housewife. Oh, I, I became one of the original loose women. And then I was a presenter, I did lots of presenting. When I left Atomic Kitten, Molly was born. I did, um, I was a very much an ITV girl. I'm very much not that now. <laughs> I don't think they'll ever have me back. So I did like a limit day. I did Britain Sexiest. I was doing a lot of presenting, Loose Women. And then we had Lily. And then I got the offer to do The Jungle. And life just after that was just change. I don't think, yeah, Brian didn't want me doing it. How long ago was The Jungle? What year was that? Oh, Lily, no, 19 years ago. She's 20. Who was in when you were there? Kate and Pete. Oh, was it that year, was yeah, it? Yeah, I won. I was the first woman to win, yeah. Uh, Katie's been on the show actually. Yeah, I love it. I was talking sports Kate the other day. Oh really? Yeah. Crackers. Crackers. <laughs> <laughs> And what changed? What changed after that? Then was it was it another another big uh, big jump of fame and work after you won the won the jungle? Well, I think I was doing a limit day, and that's when it came out. My first husband cheating on me, and that was just that was just devastating. That was the end. Of, that was the end of the first marriage. He did it on his stag do. We got married in the January, and then in the April, I was in Barbados with Molly, my mum, and Maraid filming this TV show. And then it came out he cheated, and, I, and he paid a fifteen grand keep a mouth shot. I thought, fucking hell, I give him a blowjob. I want to get a new pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not fair. <laughs> And that was the downfall of our of my first marriage, really. And we were very young, but we were we scared for like seven years. But we were babies when we met each other, so that press attention wasn't really good. And it was never the same after that. And then I got pregnant with Lily. I was like, don't even know want to be with you, let alone have a baby. But we had Lily, which was amazing. And then I got off of the jungle. Brian didn't want me doing it. He said I make a show myself, and I got Lou Welsh to convince him. <laughs> it wasn't him supposed to be flying. He, he, he didn't want to do with it. And it was our Angela, God rest herself she was flying out and next thing you know he was there that was a February and I've never experienced fame like that like you open the airport the the, the airplane doors and me and Brian were just like what the fuck I remember sitting in the hotel room and Brian's like 
it's actually like you're really the queen. Trevor McDonald, news at 10. I'm the queen of the jungle. So I was like, this is fucked up. But I don't think Brian liked that, that all the press that I was getting, because then it was like when Westlife would have like um, a press conference. What's it like being married to Kerry, you know? And then that was in February. I think it was like two months after he left the band. Oh, he was still in the band at that point. Yeah. And then he said he wanted to leave, spend time with the kids. And me, didn't see him straight in the studio. And it, it just wasn't working after that. And then in September, that's when he rang me up and said he wanted <laughs> divorce so that was that was so then I obviously had to leave England Ireland to come back to England and that's when the press and the news of the world were just horrendous so that was a massive trigger point for me of rejection and my kids from a broken home and and then you go you lie down with dogs especially dirty dogs you're gonna get fleas and obviously I went back home to my mum back on the gear that was my coping mechanism and I was just, I was having I, I was like I had these two kids I, I, I don't know what to and the, the press it's like 40 Perhaps outside your house every single day. It was insane. You, you say you got back on the gear, mate. Had you been completely off the drugs at that yeah. point? Yeah, completely. No, never even a, never. a bit of a party no. now and again. I'm, walking away from cocaine was never a problem. Giving up cigarettes was worse. So it wasn't so much an addiction. It was a coping mechanism for me. It was my, it was my saviour. It, it was there. No one else was there for me. I felt like my mum was just a different level of fish. She wasn't a supportive person at all. So cocaine became my only friend, so to speak. It was only thing that was really there for me I and mean, I could say so much about other people but that's not my story to tell but I got so much shit for it but yeah it was and I had many great nights on it but it got to a certain point that it was a life I just didn't want I remember sitting there with my mum when I was married to my second husband I said I just don't want to do this I just don't want this anymore and I packed my bags up this when I was with my second husband moved down south and never looked back and it's never bothered me in this. I, can, I can walk in a room and go you're on it you're on it you're on it it doesn't bother me in the slightest and, and you, you, talk, you talk about the the press being horrendous and mm. you know the, the 40 paps and stuff I mean did they turn on you then from you know oh yeah they put you on a pedestal they do with everyone don't they they put you on this pedestal and then they want to bring you down and uh, I'm still convinced this day that the news at world had a um a headline saying, you know, Kerry's dead. Because that, that's the way I was going. I mean, I OD'd on coke. I remember I felt like I died and I remember coming back and it was like there was these angels around me and they brought me back and it was the most wonderful, and it sounds so wrong, but it was the most wonderful. I felt so loved. I thought, my job's not done here yet because I will never, ever harm myself and I'll never, ever let my kids feel worthless the way my mum made me feel worthless. My kids know that I love them. I, I, I'm such an affectionate mum and we'll have our ups and we'll have our downs, but they know I love them more than anything and I take a bullet from them like that. Will you, um... Do you want him? <laughs> <laughs> Buy one, get four free. <laughs> the house trained. <laughs> you, you'll swap one for that pink bag, won't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for the offer. <laughs> Were you ever uh, part of the uh, phone hacking and uh, yeah. all that kind of I'm stuff? Yeah, I'm actually in a legal battle as we speak, so I can't really say much about that. Okay. But yeah, it was Prince William, Prince Harry, Kerry Katona. I remember I went to a, that. That was the news. I'm of sure it was one. more exciting to listen to your calls than it was to William and Harry's. Well, that, at the time, yeah, it was huge. And I remember I went to this uh, hacking party with Max Clifford at the time, and this lawyer came over and said, um, "Miss Katona, uh, Mr. Grant would like a word with you." Hugh fucking Grant. <laughs> oh. oh yeah, of course. I go over and he was like you know how many pages have they got on you and I was like told him how many he's like fucking hell you know so yeah that that was that was horrendous that for me I I never wanted I was suicidal I wanted to die you know these people sat outside my house my kids are going into school the kids are coming home saying stuff that people are saying to them in school and I, I just thought I'm better off dead I'm better off dead. I was so low and so down that I had nowhere to turn and it, I was suicidal and I wanted to die. And when I, I'm in the middle of a case at the minute, the same one that Harry's in at the moment. So I can't say too much about that, unfortunately. I mean, I, I guess um, just for a bit of um, time sensitive context. Harry, as if I know him dead well. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> no, just for a bit of time sensitive context I mean, we're, we're, for people listening to this in the future we're recording this the day after Hugh Edwards has been announced uh, mm. as, as the, the the mystery TV presenter oh, I knew that weeks ago well, yeah no yeah. but, the, but for, for, for the rest of the public obviously it's now been announced that you know, he's suffering depression issues mental health etc yeah. I mean as, as someone who's been obviously subjected to all this media intrusion I mean, what, what do you think him and his family are going through right now let me tell you something when it came out about Philip Schofield I had the shits for a week because it's not like it used to be they're getting off quite lightly compared to how I, I got it because they have changed. When it came out, Philip Schofield, my stomach, because I, I knew the impact that was that that 
attention from people is so awful it made me feel sick but it was also a long time coming for me because I was so judged I've shoved enough shit up my nose Matt I've drank till cows come home when I did that interview on this morning that was pure bipolar medication I've got no reason to fucking lie I did drug tests did alcoholic tests nothing in my system never done drugs on TV never done drugs at work ever that was pure bipolar medication but the way I was treated by ITV there was no aftercare no nothing they just wanted the headlines and it wasn't just ITV to me, specifically Philip, uh, Philip uh, was uh, me, you the me, I've got no qualms with Philip. Me and Philip have kissed and made up. What annoys me is the audacity and the phony and the fakeness. And oh my life, this is how you're supposed to live your life. I look after all these kids. I cook. I, I got, I'm a presenter. I do all this. Oh, they're all fucking fake. It's fake as shit, honestly. I ain't have a nervous breakdown. I've got all fucking five kids at work at home. But they all pretend to be something they're not. And that's wrong. That's what's going on with society today. It's the same with social media. Everybody wants to be somebody else. Why is nobody happy being with who you are? Because everyone only shows you what they want you to see. Not the downfalls, not your secrets. We had three lives. You've got your public life, your private life, and your secret life. And I get that, and we're all entitled to it as well. But don't pretend to be something that you're not all high and fucking mighty. And then questioning somebody else about what they're going through when you're doing ten times worse and making you feel like shit. It, the hypocrisy in it is just wrong. It angers me. Because, no, I'm the most open and honest person you meet. It just... Everyone is so fake and phony in this TV industry. It's bullshit. What do you think should happen at ITV with the ongoing inquiry? I think all the ed people need to go and they need to get a new load in. I mean, this morning is an institution in itself, isn't it? It needs rebranding. It needs new people. We all know how fake and phony it all is. It's all bullshit. And the way they spoke at the Houses of Parliament about the viewers calling us, what was it, Tracy? Tower Block Traces. Tower Block Traces. Scum absolute scum of these high and mighty people who all went to Eton. You haven't got a clue about real life or, you know, crisis that's going on in the, the world and electricity bills and all that shit. And you sit there in your big massive million pounds house and tell us how to live your life. I think it's bullshit. They need to get with real people I think I think it's a load of shite I really do I can't, I can't even I can't even watch it it's like it's so tarnished and so discredited now it's like I'd love to know what the viewers I'm sure the viewer ratings have dropped hugely on it I know the stock shares went mad they they dropped massively all of ITV stock shares have dropped and then I thought it would all go over to BBC but then you Edwards it's just that, that's all happened doesn't it and in the same context of the ITV thing uh, I mean you were with the James Grant agency mm -hmm. for a while who were the golden circle in Implicated in the Philip Schofield thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, what, what's what's your thoughts on that? Well, if you were James Grant, they're very very good at hiding your pub private life and rightly so and by, by no means everyone's entitled like say you've got three you, you got three lives haven't you you've got your public life your private life and your secret life and everyone's entitled to your privacy and i get that but then don't go on national television pretending to be something you're not and not expect to get caught that's what i'm saying live by your morals mm -hmm. do you know what i mean yes i've done drugs yes i've done that i own my shit and learn from it you know these have been lessons for me but don't sit there because pretending you're something you're not. And then what annoys me about the this morning thing is like, you know, I just remember Philip sat there, you know, being really belittling and condescending to people. It's like, hang on a minute, you're fucking a teenage boy behind your wife's back. Where the audacity of that is just ridiculous. Yep. I don't know, I'll follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> I told you you won't get more honest than me, didn't I? <laughs> it, it's easy, maybe for someone like you or me, to, it, to, it's easy to think, well, I just want to be myself and, and get on with, and get and get on with it. But I well, also... you can't because of society, because society puts you in a box. For instance, my only fans, right? So I get put in a box of, oh my God, are those poor kids, they need to get, put those kids in foster. What, because I show a bit of nipple? What about Nicole Kidman or uh, Natalie Portman finger blasting herself in bleeding black swan? Oh, it's art, darling, that's art! Let's give her millions and millions of pounds and awards. <laughs> I don't do it like that. But because I'm from a council estate and I'm not a thespian, you know, it's all, I'm, I'm selling a fantasy and they're selling a fantasy on the big screen. But because of where I'm from, I get put in a box. Who decides that? What, because I show me tits? I go tops on the beach every fucking year with my kids building sandcastles. So because I pose sexy rather than sitting like that, what's the difference? I'm in charge, I'm making the money. My kids got private education but society do put you in a box and it really pisses me off you know look at eyes wide shut with nicole kidman and tom cruise why is no one saying take those kids off them 
not disgusting. They're dry riding you. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Although I might do. <laughs> I mean, every time Money's I a, money at the end of the day. Every time I have a question come into my mind, you, you, you take me off thinking about Natalie Portman getting fingered Finger or you, you, you're you on the beach. You see what out. I'm saying though? But you see what I'm saying? You know, I, I before I did my OnlyFans, I sat my kids down and I said to them, this is what I'm going to do. But I started off as a pastry model. I was a lap dancer, a fully nude lap dancer. I own my shit and this is my body and I'll do with it what I want. And then people go, well, we're entitled to that part your life because you're selling that no you're fucking not i sell what i want of my life because it's my life if you show me a picture on your phone of say your kids does that mean i'm entitled to take your phone off you and scroll for all your pictures does it no exactly don't even let the missus do that exactly <laughs> so there you go so it's like so you know and we live in such a weird woke cancel culture you're scared of saying anything like i'm scared of taking the piss out of bipolar and i've got bipolar in case i get cancelled it's just a crazy world and it scares but me i think as well though for, you know, for, for the people that live these secrets it's an absolutely inevitable that things come out now yeah. it, it's just imp- impossible or not and i think you make a rod for your own back by having by keeping the secrets and i'm not saying it's going to be easy to come out with them but i don't know if you're a tv presenter that you know is gay mm. then I think you know if you could find a way to own it from day one go I'm great at my job I like to suck a bit of dick when I'm at home yeah. mind your own fucking business yeah. but and also, and I also all the trouble understand down the line. and I appreciate how difficult it is coming to terms with something like that it with the first girl this wasn't even about him being gay you know people forget he'd been cheating on his wife it's the lies and that it was about to come out and then to sit there with Holly and go no nothing's coming out this has been going on for years and it's just the hypocrisy of hypocrisy critical people that just lie to you and think that the public are fucking stupid. I mean, I think the government is shit. I think it's all propaganda. You know, it's all about the Rothschilds and Rockefellers. They 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 run the world. I'm a massive conspiracy theorist. I'm, you know, I love my doc. I love learning me, Matt. I love learning a lot of stuff because I've had to teach. But I just think it's all full of shit. Unless I'm on the telly, then it's real. <laughs> <laughs> and that's normally crime watch. <laughs> Well, you've mentioned a few times through this uh, through this conversation OnlyFans. Yeah. So I guess let's uh, let's let's plug dig, it, plug it, plug it, plug it. No, I'm that. not giving you mates rate, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're on there. I, 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 I'm just going <laughs> to star four six seven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to come and find you in Spain on the beach, bu- building sandcastles with your tits out. <laughs> we start to talk only about fans, OnlyFans, yeah. and then there was a pause, and you could just hear this dribbling in the background. People, yeah, people well, might wonder go. what's going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're not that good looking, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> You're not having the pink bag now. <laughs> right, OnlyFans. Yeah. How, how did it start? Well, the first lockdown, I got no work because I, and I had to pay my rent. And I had this uh, beautiful, uh, it was actually a wedding present off my first husband, jukebox with all my Brad Stewart in it, my Roy Orbison, my Elvis, my country and western. And uh, I couldn't afford to pay the rent and I had to sell it. And then someone mentioned OnlyFans and I looked into it and I thought, shall I start doing that? Because I, I, I've done nuts. I've done FHM, done Zoo, I've done all those magazines. And I thought, fuck it. So I sat the kids down. The only one who was really against it at first was our Lily. And then when the money started coming in, they all got the free iPads and they was like, mom, get your tits out. <laughs> But yeah, I'm, we're a very open family anyway. Do you know what I mean? I have no privacy. I'll go to the toilet. The kids come in asking me what's for tea and mum can have some money. I'm sat there having a shit. I'm like, kids, can you fuck off and leave me alone? <laughs> You know, so um, I was very open and honest with the children. But the thing is as well, it doesn't matter what I do, Matt. My kids are always going to get shit because I'm their mum. So it's like, well, why not just make money out of it? And our Heidi got a bit of shit and it upset her. These boys said something to her. I said, well, turn around and tell them to tell the dad stop fucking subscribing and make the <laughs> show <laughs> <laughs> and she did. You say when the money started to roll in as well. I mean, it's mm. been reported that you're earning half a million quid a month from it. Is that, is that true? Can you can you say? No, not half a million quid a month. I wish I was. But the first month I made 170. But I'm going in the millions now. That's what I'm up to. In the millions I've been doing collectively. I've for three years. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So I'm doing all right. And and how, how how do you promote it? How do people find out about it? On my Instagram, Just like the... this. I've promoted it on the TV. For me, it, it it's. I've been able to invest in myself. For me, it doesn't matter your house. I've been on every side of the coin you can think of. I went from having nothing to get my clothes off a car boot sale with me nan, going on the rob with my mum, 
that's how ski I remember being nine years of age and it was Christmas. We just got moved from a refuge into a new house. Well, it wasn't a new house, like, but we got rehomed. And it was Christmas morning and we had no decorations and the people from the refuge knocked on Christmas morning with a bin bag of secondhand stuff. Like, you know, like a love heart smell, the thing you just put in liquor drawer, they don't do them anymore. And, you know, corned beef and uh, bread. And I was so eternally grateful. And then I became a millionaire overnight and then split up with Brian. Then I got the Iceland deal. Then I had my own reality show, became a millionaire again. Gone lost a lot got a little bit back went back into bankruptcy become a millionaire again i don't know anybody who's done that i'm a grafter and i will work and continue to work my ass off because of those those kids I mean, have, you, have you learned any lessons from from losing the money the one thing i've learned is the only th money doesn't make you happy it just gives you options for me i've been on every side of the coin you can think of and what i like about the money is the options it gives me is to create these amazing adventures with my kids because it's the memories that you create with your family that is all you're going to take with you to the grave. Not your latest fucking Gucci bag or the cars or the house you live in. I can't take it. I want to make sure that I've created great adventures with the children. And, you know, and then Chris, oh, do you remember when we did that? Do you remember when we did that? And that is what I like to do. And that's why I do what I do for the kids. But do you think you're too much of a reckless spender? No, not anymore. I don't very buy anything. Oh. I put weight on and lose it. I'm up and down that much. I've got a massive wardrobe. But sometimes I put weight on. I've got a new wardrobe again because I've not worked for ages. Then I lose weight. I've got that wardrobe there because I lost weight again. But no, I'm not. I was never a reckless spender. I, I could afford to buy. I could put all the coke up my nose. I could buy all the cars I wanted. My accountant stole my money. David McHugh, Google him. He got sent down for it. But people all just think, oh, she, she, it was Mark. It was Mark did. I was with Coots Bank and I was signed, I was on that much medication, I was signing blank checks to Mark Croft. And Mom I remember Yeah, my second husband, who was my mum's drug dealer, that's how I met him. And my second I remember Max Clifford ringing me up and saying, Kerry you got into bankruptcy. I said, What? I didn't even know what bankruptcy was. What are you talking about? Minted. He went you owe a tax bill of £86,000, which was pennies to me. I was earning over half a million a year. It was nothing. I've gone and checked the bank and it's all gone. And I've gone round to my accountant's house, I've kicked his door down, I've jumped on him, I've threw hot coffee, punched him, I got rested, got through in the cells. I went, please raid him. Anyway, they raided him and in the ceiling, there was a big box and it had all these checkbooks from different accounts and different banks and then Companies House, KK Media, KK Hayek, all, all, nothing just, to do with was me. Was it just you or was he robbing other no, clients? No, he did other, other clients. I was the only celebrity one that he did. He got, I think he did seven years for it, but your money's gone, you don't get it back. So that's how I lost my bankrupt. That's that's where I lost my money. And best thing that ever happened, because you see all those little hangers on, it all just disappeared. And now I can count on one hand, maybe three hands, three fingers how many people are actually in my life now i don't need new friends i don't i've got ryan the kid the kids are my best mates that's it and dawn my friend and that, that's all i need you've mentioned max clifford a few times yeah I mean, I, I, it was a my well, son's named after max yeah max I mean, gave me away when i married uh mark croft oh really i mean it was was he was he a very influential person in your life max was like my dad i love max a bit and when i found out what he did was horrendous and i can only tell my truth and me and Max would have our arguments. I'm probably the only person who could call him a cunt and get away with it because I'm a fiery person myself. I take no bullshit either. And I think that's why Max loved me. But when I watched the documentary back, it you know it was vile. So it was very conf conflicting feelings because Max would give me a hug and I'd feel completely safe. I, me, Molly, Lily, we'd all go on a private jet. We'd go off to Marbella and I've always felt comf he never inappropriate with me whatsoever. But that doesn't mean what he did to other people. You know, he well I think he'd know I'd fucking knock him out anyway if he tried. <laughs> with me but yeah um that was awful what he done awful what he done to those girls so just going back to going back to only fans mm -hmm. you, you're you... desperate for a discount aren't you <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just going to ask to look at your photo and scroll through your phone <laughs> i mean you've, you've mentioned you've got some celebrity subscribers and any, anyone you can tell us about no no <laughs> no <laughs> what would you say if, if the kid if the kids wanted to go into only what fans? could i say Obviously, it's not something I want them to do, but what could I say? All I can do is guide them. Molly's 22, Lily's 20. I highly doubt them two would ever do anything like that. They're really tough cookies, my kids. Really tough cookies, very well-mannered. They're great kids. I've done a bloody good job, and I, I did it. I raised my children. They do me bastard heading, but, you know, if that's something they wanted to do, then what 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 could I, what could I do? I couldn't do anything, apart from just possibly guide them and try and make them do something else instead of that. But what 
I, I, I can't do anything about it. They've got to be their own people. All I can do is that they've grown up now. That I've guided them. They, they're, they're grown ups. They, they know right from wrong. They can make their own minds up and their own decisions. And, you know, I'm still learning as a mum. I'm every day somewhat different. My son's just been diagnosed with ADHD. You know, we've had to pull him out of school. That's been hard breaking to deal with i've got five kids five different personalities five complete different needs and wants what are you doing with them now you've pulled them out of school to be i just put them in a cage under stairs <laughs> social services <laughs> <laughs> so no he's been he's a well so we got in touch with the council and they found like this college where he can go and do um like one day a week because he wants to be an apprentice he wants to work in buildings so luckily um, how old is he he is 15. My partner's dad, they own their own family building business, so that's something he wants to look into. Construction. Max won't come into this industry. And you mentioned you mentioned your partner, R- R- Ryan, I think yeah. he's called, yeah? So this is, um, so you've been married three times. Yeah, divorced twice, widowed once. And, I mean, is it going to be wedding number four? Oh, fuck no. I don't know. We've been together for five years. Normally, at this point, I've popped a few sprogs out. I'm talking to divorce lawyers at this point. <laughs> there are going to be no more kids? Definitely no more kids. 100% no more kids. Ryan has no biological children of his own. He does want to adopt DJ. DJ wants Ryan to adopt her. How old Ryan? He's eight years younger than me. He's an amazing stepdad. You know, I would not be able to do my work if it wasn't for him. He's a stay-at-home dad. But... We are business partners as well. So we have Marnie, our own dating site. We've got MFit, which is our fitness site. We've just opened a new one called Dedicated, which is exclusive like travel, security, Rolexes, all that kind of stuff. We're also looking into the banking game as well. So yeah, we it, it's difficult sometimes for me and him to wear different hats and forget. Sometimes we forget that we're engaged to each other as well. But we might just go off to Vegas in November and just do it. I got married in Vegas, dressed as Captain Kirk on the Starship Enterprise. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I've run out of ideas because I've had that many bleeding weddings. <laughs> yeah, like, but got... I think if we do, we'll just, we'll just go out, just me, Ryan and the kids, and just and get by Elvis. That's it. And then go Benny Hanna's afterwards in Vegas because I love Benny Hanna's. But yeah, because I also think if anything was to happen to me, I know, especially the younger three, Max Heidi and... DJ, you know, they've got Ryan. They've only that you know, Molly and Lily've got their Irish side. Whereas Max Hyde and DJ, they've only got me. You know what I mean? I'm Ryan. So I think by getting married, if anything was to happen, it'd be a lot easier. Well, um, you've had a recent scoliosis diagnosis. Am yes, I, am, I I say, am I saying that scoliosis. right? Scoliosis. Yeah. That was, yeah. That was why you were, you were putting your legs yeah, up, keep, showing me your yeah. fancy trainers. Yeah. I have to keep moving, but I'm all right at the minute, to be honest with you. I'm not too bad. It's just the drive, yeah. So I've, I've lived with chronic pain for years and years and years, but I'm such a workaholic. What kind of chronic, but like, like back pain? Yeah, things. I mean, I've been on painkillers for eight years. I've been on Tramadol and Pregabalin for eight years because of my pain, but they, they barely touch me anymore. And it got to a point I just got off tour and I was in a different bed, driving driving myself yes I've got the nice Yoris with the massage seats but when you travel in the country and the pain was so bad I couldn't even get out of bed and I finally went and got it checked because I just think oh I'll, I'll carry on I'll carry on I'll carry on I've got work got work and yes yeah, so I've got scoliosis I've just been for a full body MRI as well because I've got arthritis and hips as well <laughs> but I don't I, I love my mum but I don't want to be my mum my mum's 63 and looks two days older than God and can barely move you know I want to be around for as long as possible for my children and I want to be the best version I can be of myself so I want to be fit and healthy well, what, what's the ongoing impact of scoliosis Do, does it get worse because it's, yeah. it's for people who listen it's a twisting of so spine, yeah, right? so I have no curvature. So you know how you uh, there's no curvature in my back. So th- this oh, is that what you uh, you were just sticking. I thought yeah. you were sticking your chest out. Well, well, I'll, well, I'll, well let's say. It. Um, <laughs> so th- this bone here is supposed to go that way. Mine goes the opposite way, and then it started twisting at my neck, and it's twisted at the bottom of my spine. So it is really, really painful. I've had two breast reductions, thinking that might help. <laughs> is, it, is it is it something you're born with that gets progressively worse? I have no idea. I, I've just had chronic pain. I remember I was 19 and I fractured my coccyx and I couldn't walk for six weeks and I remember Brian having to carry me to the toilet that's how bad it was but I, it, I've always had pain but I've just because I've lived with pain every day I'm so used to it I've just I never go get myself checked out I never but I thought I can't carry on like this anymore so I've got the diagnosis and so now it's just a matter of I'm at the doctor's three times a week to constantly keep getting treatment and it's something you've got to live with and what's the treatment like physio massage physio, physio and chiropractor massages yeah but it's something that you're, you're always going to get but as the kids there's just days I'm like oh my god my fucking back I'm in so much pain I'm in so much pain and I get a phone call for work right okay I'm off you know, so that that's how I've always been. I'm, I never, I'm quite fit and healthy. I eat the right foods, very, very, very rarely drink. I exercise, but I don't 
if I've got an issue or a problem, I don't look after it because I just go to work and just try and crack on and just carry on. But it got to a point that I couldn't do it anymore. So I've actually took quite a bit of time off work. Like I had a tour coming up called Carry No Regrets. So I pulled the tour, postponed it. What was that, like a speaking tour? Yeah, it was just after my third book, Hole Again, which was very much about my third husband and the abuse and things like that. Yeah, so my third husband, George, who I know since was 14, was really abusive. Is he the one that passed away? Yeah, so that's DJ's dad. Right. He battered me, blacked my eyes. He was inside for six years for cutting people's toes off, and that was a turn on for me. That was that was how I was brought. They they were the men I was surrounded by as a kid, and I thought I could change change George. But it was just his anniversary of four years of him being dead, and then I was supposed to go and do the gig on the Friday, and I just mentally I couldn't do it, and I was in pain with my back. So I just thought I just because I want to be a motivational speaker. I want to go into prisons. I want to help as many people. As I can by telling my story and giving them hope that you can get through it all that you know sometimes all this guilt and worry and it's be like it's like being on a rocking chair and going back and forth it's getting you nowhere it's how you deal with those issues but I knew I wasn't mentally prepared to sit on a stage for 80 90 minutes talking about the abuse because it, it I just finished doing the audio book I just finished doing the book and then the paperback came out and then it was his anniversary and I thought I haven't mentally and I I don't feel I've dealt with the trauma because it still gives me fear so I just didn't think I was ready for it so I postponed it because I wanted to make sure that my mental health and my physical health is the best that when I do go and do it that it'll be amazing. How old's DJ now? She's nine. And where's does she ask questions? Does, does she She's know only ever known Ryan so she was five when her dad died but she was four when I was dating when Ryan came into her life right. but she hadn't seen her dad for a year. Oh so so um, he didn't die when you were together you split up? We split up we were still married he refused to marry me. Divorce he refused you. to divorce me sorry so yeah so George was a very very disturbed man. like he'd spit in my face and DJ started spitting in my face so she didn't know any different and then he he was he was he was really really troubled really troubled man but we know each other since we were 14 and I loved him so much but it was very it's really weird because I remember saying at some time I'll never forgive myself with my girls they never witnessed anything they've never seen anything but they saw the black eyes and that's something I'm struggling with to forgive myself for bringing him into their lives because the trauma he's caused to them as well. And tell me, I mean, obviously you say you've known for a long time and, and the world you were in, those kind of things were a turn on to you back mm. then. Obviously not having experienced If I personally. met Ryan 10 years ago, I'd have been bored to tears. So so I guess you, you're kind of answering like, like the be, opposite question. Uh, yeah. If you got with a guy now who beat you, no, there'd be no, no Ryan done on day one. Ryan is complete polar opposite I could never ever I still get scared to talk about George and so and I'm so angry that he died and just left because he he wanted to kidnap DJ inject her with heroin then kill her and then kill himself and then you got like that fucking father so justice saying oh you're it's like you have no idea what we went through that man my kids will tell you that it's been a uh, horrendous how was he with the older kid like when he's beating you or what was he doing with the older kids they didn't say they heard they heard that something I'll never forgive myself but he was never abusive to them no he was mean with his vocals and he, he verbal abuse especially with Molly and that is something I and that's why I believe Molly went to Ireland with her nan and granddad and I don't blame her and that's the best thing she could have done and that's something I've got to forgive myself for but it has happened and we've all just got to move on from it my kids ring me every day so I've got got Lily moved out this year she's 20 she's moved back down south with her mates and and I've just got the other three at home so I'll give it more time they'll be gone thankfully <laughs> I'm joking, but yeah, I mean, I, I have made many mistakes, and I think my my biggest mistakes are the ones where I failed my own children. That's something. But I am the most loving mum and hands on with them, and I brought them up. Guys, I know you know Brian. Never went to parents' evening. Never went to sports day. I know that's affected them. You know, I know he's a great dad now with Ruby, and that's amazing. But I know that affects my Molly and Lily, and that kills me. Mark Croft has nothing to do with Max and Heidi. That kills me. So when I split up with George, like Mac, they all called George dad. Even in front of Brian and he wanted to speak to DJ and I went Max and Heidi are asking when they can see you and this was the cruelest thing he ever did he went they're not my kids I'm only interested in DJ and that killed me and to this day that still upsets me because he just did that to hurt me and they just wanted because as far as they're concerned he was their dad but DJ has DJ's memory is just like she has no recollection before. I could talk about her dad, but she gets a bit funny about it. But I've never hired the facts of who her dad is or anything like that. When, when she gets old enough to ask and understand, but you'll be honest. She asked me that. now, yeah, but she she know she does know a lot. I'm, we're a very open and honest family. My kids know all about my drugs. I've even mentioned it in front of DJ because kids are very cruel. 
And it's like really weird. Like Max and Heidi, they came home and said, oh, your mum's a cokehead. They're talking about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, last time I touched drugs. And it's like, how do they know that? Because their parents tell them. And then they come into school. So I'd rather my kids hear it off me. You know, I yeah, I've made mistakes. Look, look, let's set, let's set the parents, let's set kids off parents. Of all the parents who've done coke at a weekend, half that fucking country won't have the kids. Yeah, I've been clean, what is it, how old is Max? 14 years. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. Nothing doesn't bother me in the slightest. Like it was more the people you hang around with. You got to look to your left and look to your right, and they're the people who you're eventually going to become like. And I had to cut a lot of people out of my life. So for me, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. I very rarely drink. Yeah, but Ryan is an amazing, amazing stepdad. I think like in school, like everyone calls him her dad. So yeah, so we're going to go down the uh, adoption route. Cool. Exciting. Well, listen, there's just one more, one more, I guess, um, past incident I just want to ask and dig into before we wrap up. I know back in 2007, you had the, you were kidnapped, uh, kidnapped, held, held, held hostage, hostage at home. Yeah, yeah. At home. Uh, talk to me about that. That was horrendous. That was that. So because of what I'd been through as a child, like this was like, I can't go through this again, surely. So it was three masked men with balaclavas. But, but just, I mean, were you in bed? Were you watching I was in Wimbledon. I was downstairs in the cinema room. Our hide was five weeks old. Molly and Lily had just gone to Ireland for the summer holidays with Maraid and Brendan. And um, these three blokes came down. I had a massive house mansion in Wimslow, and they had balaclavas on. One had a butcher's hook, a sledgehammer, and a carving knife. And they made me get undressed, took me top off. It, it was horrendous. How did, how did they get in? Uh, the side door of the garage. Oh, okay, so and I think Mark Croft had something to do with it. Were you with him at the time? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But then I had a nervous breakdown, and then I had to go to. Because it, it triggered memories. Because I, I have a fear of knives. Because I, Dave, we said he was Freddy Krueger and he was oh, yeah. going to chop us up. So I have a fear of being in foster home. And so I went in the priory because I was so shook up. And every time I was in the priory, people also have to think it's drugs. And it isn't. I had bipolar. So as well, I was always there for trial and error with medication as well. And uh, I went there because I was traumatised. And I said to Marae, we mind looking after the children. I was in there for two weeks, getting therapy, came out. And Marae <laughs> refused to give me my kids back. So I eventually took her to court and got my kids back anyway. But uh, it, it was horrendous. All because I got held hostage. It was my fault. And Who I was my... in the house? It just, it was Mark there as well? Mark was there. It was oh. just me, Mark and Heidi. Heidi was five weeks old. And Molly and Lily was in Dublin. And thank God. And then afterwards, I found a book saying how to burgle your own house. Really? We Mark it because Mark did a the book. Yeah, Mark did the cocaine video as well. Right. So yeah, he set me up good and proper. Well, but I... what a story to <laughs> tell, eh, Max? Uh, how... It's been a colourful life. <laughs> how, how big is the book of how to rob your own house? I don't know how big it was, but I remember <laughs> getting. I found it. My friend Debbie was like, "I'm telling you, it was Mark. It was Mark. He was in on it." And it, it was just. I was almost like a cash cow for everybody. I wanted saw me as an ATM, and I was so desperate to buy everybody's love. And like when I won the jungle, all I all I wanted to be is loved. That's all I wanted is, is to be loved. Love. That, that 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 and I think my longest relationship I've ever had has been with the press. It's been like an abusive marriage. We've had our highs and our lows, but I need the press and they need me. So it, you know, I can't complain about it anymore. I've learned how to deal with it, and I, I use it to my own advantage now. It took me a long time. Like I'll do my own pap pictures. No shame in doing that. Why should I let another pap get a picture of me and they make the money when it's my face? Hmm. Hang on a minute. Tell you what. Me and you, we'll go halves. Well, we don't get more than that. Me and you, <laughs> take a picture so no one else gets it and I'll make my own money. I've got kids to feed. So I have no shame in saying, yeah, do my own pop picture. You won't get anyone else saying that. But yeah, business is business at the end of the day. Someone's going to take a picture. Let me get someone else to do it so I get the money. And you, you, you mentioned <clears> your stays in the Priory. I mean, what, what, what's what's it like in there? Oh, the Priory was shite. So the first time I went in the Priory was because I had a breakdown after Brian left me. I was with James Grant at the time. There was me, I, I had the same management as Ant and Deck and Phillips go. Field and I, I just, I remember seeing Brian in a hotel. I don't know if he was a dental good. I just had a breakdown. I, I, I was devastated, and I was, I was absolutely devastated. And that was a massive trigger, for, you know, coming back home and then just being with all these deadheads, really. And they couldn't treat me because my profile at the time was so high that they um, had to send me to Arizona for six weeks to America to Cottonwoods. Sorry. <laughs> so Cottonwood, so I went to America for six weeks. I remember thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I had Molly and Lily. I thought, I, I can't believe I, I've got this long. This is where I am. But I completely misjudged rehab because I'd never been before. I thought it was full of smackheads. It's not like that in the slightest. It's people with, you know, codependency issues, self-harm, 
eating disorder, sex addiction, gambling, mental health issues. It was so much bigger than that. And I couldn't believe the amount, there was like a judge in there, like a high ranking judge. And they had, there was these really, I like really well to posh people who had these really high and mighty jobs. And I was gobsmacked because I was from a really shitty council estate. I thought I, I'm a, a, a low life now. But when I went into it, it really opened my eyes and I will never judge anybody because I judge think I judge myself thinking oh my god this I must be like a little scumbag but that wasn't the case at all I was just mentally struggling and cocaine just became a friend to help me cope with it but and then you have to do your appreciations and your disadvantages for it and you know it's something I had to get rid of it was never like I got up every day I was like oh I need to get coke I was a binger I was a bit like once I started I couldn't stop really so like Friday to Sunday I had, I had many great times <laughs> I'm not gonna lie but it got to a point that I was using it for the wrong reasons not that should, anyone should ever use cocaine because it's a devil's dandruff and it will ruin your life well listen it has been a wild hour or so it's been yeah a, it's been a good conversation it has <laughs> well you got many I, many I, stories to I, tell I've got so much more but we haven't got time <laughs> by the book <laughs> well, we'll 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 do, we'll do a round two to to finish off on the stories we've not done, and uh, yeah. I'm sure if we pick up in five or ten years' time, uh, well, there you go. I'm sure so it'll be completely different. Probably only fifty votes or something by then. <laughs> Hey, you've got to be an old romantic, haven't you? Well, listen, I look forward to uh, to watching the uh, the pictures of the the Vegas wedding in the press. Well, they, we... well, I'll say, hey, if I want to sell it, I'll sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Kerry, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for having me, Matt. Really appreciate it. Thank thanks, you. guys. Yeah. <laughs>